Hello, everyone. My name is Peter, and I'd like to welcome you to this Vector Zero webcast. I believe that all attendees will have a couple of panels available, chat and questions. If you have any questions, please put them into that questions panel, and uh, we will try to answer them at the end or potentially over email. Um, if anyone has sound issues or video issues, I'd appreciate it if you would just send a chat to me. I'm Peter Frischock, and we'll see what we can do to correct those. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, this is our first webinar, so please forgive any minor glitches. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Philip Knapp, who is our key engineer on GIS features. So take it away, Philip. Hello, everyone. My name's Philip, as Peter just mentioned, and I'll be leading today's webinar. Uh, We'll be covering a variety of concepts today, but most of them are just the basic um, getting started on a scene with GIS data. Um, we'll be working on getting the data first, getting our scene in the right spot in the world, putting data in the scene, and again, we'll just briefly work on it for one or two rows just to show some of the features. Afterward, I'll, uh, take, or I'll go over some tips and suggestions if we have time about handling data that's not geo-referenced and improving performance when dealing with GIS data. Um, for the last five minutes or so, I'll open up to questions or a little bit earlier, depending on how much we get through. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So first, we want to go for go look for data. So when we go for data, we have a page in our user guide, which again can be accessed through the Help User Guide button in Roadrunner. Um, every version will have this in 2019, I believe, which will directly link us to our user guide. This will bring up your web browser. The first thing we would need to do is look at USGS. Um, let's see, where is it? I don't think I see it there. Let's scoot down to, I gotta find it real quick. Let's go ahead and click this link. This brings us to ah, how to articles. So in this case, this will show um, how to get data from USGS. This is free data within the US. Um, for external sources, you guys should inquire to info at vector0inc.com about your region, and we'll see if we can provide any resources for you. Now, once we've done that, you can go to the first link, which is the basic viewer, which for USGS is one of many of the viewers they provide. This is the one that I prefer using because it seems to be one of the most simple ones. And once we've got that up, we're going to need to find the region that we're going to work on. In my case, I picked a random location near uh, Los Angeles, which is Downey in this area here. And I'll just map out a small region by grabbing the region picking tool. So we can grab out a section of data here. And I'll just grab somewhere around here for the data that we'll be grabbing. Great, now once we have the region we want, we need to go over here to pick the data that we're gonna be grabbing. So for this case, we'll be picking elevation, which is our dim. This will tell us the height of the terrain at that region. Uh, the area I picked is pretty flat, so I also picked a region over towards the mountains over here, but we'll cover that in a bit as well. For here, uh, we want to pick the smaller, more dense uh, resolutions of data. Not all regions are going to have really dense resolutions, but roughly speaking, the smaller the arc second or one meter dim is preferable. So in this case, because we don't necessarily know what data is present, we'll go ahead and pick all three. We also want LIDAR if it's available. LIDAR is useful for lining up some of the roads, and we'll show that later as well. And last, we need imagery. The imagery in this case will help us see buildings, see trees, and other data that maybe can't be pulled out from the LiDAR data that we'll be using. Once we're done, we'll go ahead and click Find Products. This will go ahead and start searching for data in that region, and we can go ahead and pull up the results page. We can now see that these are four images, which you can see here, and we can show the regions using the footprint buttons and see that they line up with the region that we're interested in. So we'll go ahead and grab all four of these. In the elevation products, 
we'll see a number of elevation of our products, but only one of these is really the one we want to grab. These are all fairly low resolution, being only one third arc seconds. And we probably want to use something a little bit better if we can. So one ninth is in better than the others, but at the end of the day, we're going to use one meter because this is the highest resolution. You can see where that footprint is by, I'll go ahead and clear the other ones. So click footprint here. We can see this easily covers the region that we're going to be working on. And last, we need to get our LIDAR. So in this case, LIDAR being as high density as it is, usually takes up much less space within the region. So you'll actually need to download potentially nine, 10, or even more of these. Each one can be added manually if they're the ones you want, or you can click at the top here and just add all of them, which we'll go ahead and do. Once we're done picking the data that we want to use, we're gonna go over to our cart. Within our cart, it will show us all the data we've added, which I forgot to add the elevation data, I think. I did. And now we'll have all the data that we want. Once we're good to go, these are all JPEG 2000 files, which load directly into Roadrunner, but not all of them are things that can load directly into Roadrunner, like the elevation data, because they are download or they're provided in a zip file. So if we download that, which I have already downloaded, so I'll go ahead and just bring over the folder. This is roughly what it'll look like. It'll be a zip. Of course, I'm using 7-zip here to unzip it. We'll go into that zip file, and we'll see that there's a number of files. The one we want is the IMG file. That provides all of the elevation data that we need, and you can just drag this into the folder in Roadrunner. So if we go down here, I've already provided both. And again, the other file here is the one I'm covering for a more hilly region, because I think it looks much cooler than this flat one does. And that's the one that we'll be placing some more roads on. Next, you'll make sure you download all of the um, LAS and LAZ files that you will have here. These, even if you click the LAS file, will still download an LAZ file. And this is because the new zip format for these, or not zip, the compressed versions of these are much, optim much more optimized than the LAS. They're basically compressed versions of the LAS file. Um, sadly, these do not load, in, load into Roadrunner directly yet. And so once you've downloaded each of these, you're going to need to uncompress them. There is a page in how to um, decompress them that's also found in our user guide under the how-to articles. And this will show you where to download LazZip, which is a program that we'll be using to bring in our files and uncompress them. I do have a guide here as well that has screenshots that talks about uncompressing them, and but I'll briefly cover it here as well. So I've already had, uh, loaded all of the data, downloaded it, and I've put it in a folder, and I've now added each one of these files to the, um, I guess basket might be an okay word here. And now that I've got them all in, I can investigate which regions I want to potentially convert, and then when I'm done, looking at the regions, I'll go ahead and process all the files. I've put an output directory, but it, uh, normally it would just output to the same directory that the files are in, which could be okay. And then when we're done, we're gonna click decompress. Then just click start and you have your data decompressed for you. You can see what I mean by looking at my point cloud here. Here's all of the LAS files and the LAS files here, which do not load. If you can't find this in the user guide, you may also be able to search the error message that's given to you that says the schema is not recognized. And then again, once we uh, update some of our libraries, this will load into Roadrunner and you may, will not have to worry about it in the future. But until we get around to that, you still have to decompress them. Now, once we have all of our data in our given folders, which you can see here, I have our more data, and lastly, our elevation here, we can get started on putting our scene in the right location. Here, because I dragged in one of the files, it already set our world location. But for some scenes, you'll probably want to pick where the center of your scene is. So we're gonna go ahead and clear the data, and we're going to pick a location, uh, which I can go back to the viewer, and I think I can go over here and look at where our lat long is here at our center point. So we can probably pick uh, maybe right here between the 42 and Brookshire Avenue. So if we look at our 
bottom left corner, it looks like 33, 93, 83. Shout out the points. 33, 93, 83. So that's our first latitude. And then our longitude, which will be negative 118, 1296. Now, if we apply these changes, you can see that we now have a projection on our scene, which will be relative to our center point. So basically, every time we drag in a file, it'll automatically be placed in the right region. So if we bring in one of the files, you can see that it's loaded up here. Bring another one, another one, and so on and so forth. I'll go ahead and grab the other one. Now, when we drag these in, one thing that is important to know is that we have a resolution for our textures, which can be found here, but this doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, the highest resolution, or B, that it's the lowest resolution. In this case, 0.3 is twice as high resolution as the files are. So we're actually wasting pixels that we're converting, even though our files are not as dense. So for performance, we want to go ahead and shrink this down to 0.6. One, it'll load faster, and two, it'll be as high resolution as any value lower than that, because all of our files that we're given are all smaller in resolution than what we were trying to load. Now that we've got some of this started, let's look at some of the other data. In this case, that was aerial imagery, and you can see here that it loaded it. These images are particularly less dense than some of the other ones you can find on USGS, but 0.3 and 0.6 are still pretty good resolutions, and we can easily start seeing some of the features like lane markings, cross um, intersections and marking styles, parking lots, etc. Now let's go ahead and add in our elevation data. And here you can see that the picture before, which I'll go ahead and go to our view panel, I will toggle off the elevation and you can see that the region is now elevated with the elevation data. This is good because it allows us to be correct to the elevation of the real world and we can immediately put roads, which I'll go ahead and show here, at the correct resolution, I mean at the correct height, sorry, as our elevation data that we were given. There's not a lot to improve on elevation data, but keeping your workspace relatively small will make things load much quicker. And the workspace here allows us to shift where we want to load data. So if I want to load data here, we can drag it over, click apply, and our data will now load in this region. Usually you don't want to increase your workspace as large as the data you have because it'll take much longer to load potentially. And you're not really going to be working on large, you know, 10 mile by 10 mile regions at one time. So it's better to keep your workspace about the size of the area you're going to be working on, work on that region, and then move to the next region. So just grab it, move it over, click apply again, and have it load the next region. Again, you saw that it took some time for the imagery to load and the elevation came first, and again, that's because we just picked such a large region. Next, we're going to go ahead and look at point clouds. Point clouds are usually very dense and contain a lot of data, and while that's good, it can also damage performance. So again, keeping your workspace small will improve the utility and easiness of dealing with the point cloud. It's also just removing clutter um, from points that are bad data and other points that are maybe not useful to what you're currently working on, which may draw behind. So for now, we're just gonna go ahead and grab all of them and load them into Roadrunner. And again, because they all have projection information, which can be found here, and again, this is within the file, we didn't have to set anything up, it'll go ahead and put it in the right locations. Now, when we've got LiDAR loaded, we can do some unique coloring and other options within it to make it look more useful. Because right now it's just a bunch of gray pixels and although you can see different height, and again, there's some of the high error noise, we need to go ahead and flip over to intensity. And so now it's black. Some users might be like, hey, what's with the, the data? It doesn't look right. This is because the points here are all, um, being shaded down due to the intensity mins and maxes. This can happen for a number of reasons, but usually it's a sign that's really reflective 
And so it will be the only white object in the scene. So if we bring down our max, this will start to lighten it up a bit. Now you can start to see some detail. And usually you'll need to play with the data a little bit to figure out what the right min and max values are for your specific data set. Um, in this case, I think I played around for a little while, brought up some of the color. I think I might've brought this down and that allowed us to pull out some of the markings and data a little bit more from our point cloud. Once we have our point cloud loaded and it looks relatively good, which I think we could probably make it look a little better if we can lighten it up a little bit more, then we can get started working with the data. Again, we can easily disable and enable certain views by turning them off using the hotkeys or by pressing one of the view buttons here. So in our case, I'll go ahead and disable some of the other data just so we can look at just the point cloud. I've disabled the elevation and I've disabled the aerial imagery so that we can just look at the intensity values that are provided from the point cloud. This can help be useful because it'll show us where trees are. It can show us some detail in the roads like arrows that maybe we can't decipher from the image because it's too low resolution and other data that we can now use for lining up um, various other pieces. So I've turned back on the aerial image and the elevation and we can now start looking at some of the tooling that these provide us. Again, you can immediately create roads at a specific height, which is very useful because now we don't have to bring it up. But you'll see here in the 2D editor for our height profile that it doesn't necessarily always line up with the point cloud and sometimes not with the elevation directly. And this can occur because when we put down our road, it really only takes the height of the first point and then it's straight across. To get it to match our elevation, which I'll go ahead and turn off the point cloud real quick just so we can look at it, we want it to match the elevation. We need to hit the project roads button. When you hit this project roads, it'll now flatten out and match to the, sorry, not flatten out. It will now project onto the elevation data. Currently, we do not provide any way to project to point clouds, but we're looking to add that in the future. If you want to correct data because it's either not high, it uh, doesn't contain perfect alignment with yours, or because you actually want it to now fit to the point cloud, you can hit Control A, select all the points, and just bring up the road a bit. Once you've got that up, you can of course adjust any of the other road points as well until you've got it aligned with your point cloud. And now we've, you can see it sometimes clipping through the point cloud because it is pretty close to matching. Similarly, if we go to the, uh, let's see here, cross-section tool. This also contains for the profile of the lanes exactly where the edges would be. In this case, this is a curb, but I'm actually not on the curb as you can see here from the data. So I'll go ahead and bring us in here. Because the curb's over here and the points are here, I'm obviously getting some points that are below, but if we were to extend the road to that corner, which I'll go ahead and try and drag out. I think it's somewhere around here, we can actually see where the curb ends from our point cloud due to the height difference. Don't know for sure if I brought it over far enough, but this of course is a tree, so I think we need to pull it in a little bit because I think that's where the curb is, but I think you get the point. We can bring this back in a little bit and correct it so that the height fits at that location. <laughs> Now for some of the more interesting parts, we can project other data to much more difficult um, elevation and terrains. So I don't have point cloud for this region over here, but I'll go ahead and drag in the new data. So we've got the one that's over here now. I'll go ahead and go into the world settings tool, which can be found at the top. Sorry if I didn't hit that easy enough before. And let's investigate this region. Um, see if this is the right spot. So now we can actually see that the height of the terrain here is very unique and that it's 
much more visible that we have height differences here. So if we were to create a road on this terrain, which we want to be top down and switch to orthographic mode, which you can either do by hitting O or going into view and orthographic. This will make sure that we're top down and we are correctly putting a road along a given edge. Of course, I think this is a trail. So let's not do that one. This is what I meant to do. And if we don't want these side lanes, of course, we can go in and remove them. Not good enough. Actually, I think there's... I'll go and get rid of those as well. And now we can just start digitizing on top of this. And now have a road around here. along this image. Of course, again, because we haven't hit the project road yet, it's all at the same height, but once we hit the project roads, boom, it goes up top, it's now in the correct spot, and it's much easier to see that we've actually got the height correct when we look at the profile. So here we're looking at the profile, you can see that the blue line is the elevation data, so if I go ahead and grab the road off, this is the elevation data, and the green points before were the point cloud, and now the road is the red. All right, everyone, we're getting towards the end, so if you have questions, be sure to ask the uh, into them in the questions panel. Um, if there's anything else you'd like me to cover briefly, I can also do that. Just while we're waiting for questions to come in, I will go ahead and show one other thing that works out pretty well. Let's go ahead and say no. I have this unprojected just drawing I came up with. So I'll go ahead and set the default type to aerial image because it needs to be known that it's an image. For projections, well, we'll need to pick the center point of the file, which for now I'm going to make fictitious and leave it in the center of the ocean. Um, this is meter space, so we'll just go with that. You can see here it's a transverse mercator at the middle of the ocean, and I've brought it in. Of course, this drawing is, one, very large compared to what a road should be, <laughs> but I did provide a scale here. In this case, this scale would be seven meters because that's just the arbitrary value I picked. Of course, it could mean anything. Usually if you have data that's from a real world scene, you actually can use a measurement tool to figure out how big the data is. Roughly here, this is around 72 meters. So we'll go ahead and get the correct value by looking at the division. So seven divided by 72, which is currently 72, but we want it to be seven. Looks like about 0.096 or 0.72 um, meters per texel here. This is what we're trying to figure out. Now that we have that value, we can go in here look at our resolution and set it to the correct value. And now we have the correct sized picture. Of course, now that it's 0.072, you can see that it looks very low res. But we can fix that by going into the aerial imagery tool and changing it to 0.0792, or just pasting in the value we had previously, which you can just paste in there. Once we hit enter, it'll now improve quality, of course, which is nice. We'll go ahead and change our workspace to be much smaller as well. So we'll fit bounds there. And now we have a smaller region to work with. Next, we'll just briefly go over road styles. These will allow us to create a simple road when we right click, which is good. We'll go ahead and start the road here. And now it's obviously a little too big because this road is bigger than seven meters in width. Once we delete the edges, it should be pretty close. Great. Now that we've got this here, we can go ahead and digitize on an image that never came from a actual referenced source, which may or may not be what some customers want to do. In some cases, or some users I should say, in some cases you may have an image which you've grabbed from another source that is not projected and needs to be solved for. So you'll need to find the difference in width from what it is in the scene. So basically every meter was a pixel at the default. Of course I want it to be seven meters at that value. So I shifted the scale 
And now we have this road, which fits nicely along some drawing I just threw together. Oops. Go ahead and keep it more or less good here. And now we have a road that we can was made from a drawing entirely and start fitting on some of the lane marking types. Let's see here, I'll go ahead and throw a solid white on each sedge. And I'll go ahead and turn off the image, so view, aerial imagery. And now we can see we have a road that was based off a of drawing. All right, Peter, Philip, did you have Yeah, we have collect? some questions. Maybe the first one, if you happen to have data handy, we had a question about our ability to use uh, OSM to uh, import basic roads. So we don't currently have a tool that imports OSM into roads. You can visualize it in the vector data tool, but I don't think I have any references currently that I can throw in here. Uh, another question is, um, is it possible to make the work uh, space a custom shape or multiple squares? There is not a way currently to do that. Um, when we move on and improve the tools, we should be able to allow custom shapes. I don't know if we'll provide the ability to create multiple workspaces at a time, but we'll have to uh, see if that's useful. Yep. Another question was, uh, can you project junctions down to elevation in the same way that you did roads? I believe you can. So it projects the roads. It does not necessarily project the entire height of the junction. The junction will be based on the roads. So if I go ahead and go, ahead and go back real quick. Let's go ahead and nah, let's not save the data. Let's go to the elevation here. We have a road that we build across here, which I'll need some imagery to see. If we have that junction there, if we grab our roads, put it across, do the same thing on this side, we can go ahead and select both, or not select anything and hit project. Oh, sorry, I do need to select the things I want. Project, and we should see at the Function here that we are at the elevation of the junction that exists in the elevation data. If, no, your, it, if your particular intersection is very large or there aren't roads going across it, it may not always fit, but there are other ways to work around that. Yeah, and um, I think we should probably, uh, um, this can get complicated when you have very high changes in elevation, you know, where let's say these roads are both on hills, but that's right. potentially something that we can illustrate a little bit more later. Um, it's not in our tool itself, but there was a question, if you happen to have messy elevation data, where let's say there are some extraneous values or it's just very spiky, are you aware of tools that would help smooth that out? I don't know of a tool that can smooth that out. GDAL might provide utilities. That's G-D-A-L, all caps, um, which is a geospatial library that we use for loading images, contains a large tool set that can potentially smooth out values for you. I haven't looked into anything that does that currently, but um, we can look into it potentially and see if there's any tooling. Now, um, we have one question. It's not GIS related, but can we create custom road styles? Yes, you can. To do that, if you have, say, another lane you wanted added, so I'll go ahead and use the add tool. I'll just go ahead and add a lane to one of these roads, maybe two on one side, which is cool. Now we have a one left and three right side road. To create a road style, which is not the clearest way to do it, into the cross section tool, select the one of the road ends or any cross section in between, and you can do create road style, which I believe goes into the folder you're currently using. So I'll go in here, say hey, create road style, and we now have our one left, three right. We can name it here. Uh, let's see, one backward, three forward. And now if I click on this and I create a road, it will now be that road style as well. So let me get rid of the imagery so you can see a little bit All better. Right. 
coming uh, close to the end. There have been a number of people who have the question if we will record uh, this webinar and make it available. I believe that is the case. Uh, there are also some questions we didn't have a chance to answer. We'll either answer those individually or put together sort of a, a general questions that were asked during the webinar sheet and then provide it to the participants. Um, at this point, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, Philip, any final words there? No. Thanks, everyone, for coming along to our first webinar. Yeah, and if you uh, have any thoughts on what you'd like to see as topics, then info at vectorzero.io, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all. Goodbye.